Hi, I'm Steve Johnson from SoutheastAsianNews.org. Great to have you with us. Welcome to the Forbidden History Series Part 1, The Ancient Australians. On this Australia Day of 2014, we are going to pose the question, did Captain Cook discover Australia or did he invade Australia? In this interview, we pose a few questions about the original inhabitants of Australia and their connection to the indigenous that met them. Here is my interview with researcher, author, and archaeologist, Mr. Stephen Strong. He has documented many, many sites around Gosford and the central coast in New South Wales of extreme archaeological significance. Hello. Right here in the studio, we have a prominent researcher and documentary maker, Mr. Stephen Strong. He's made an incredible video series called Egyptians in Australia on YouTube. And he's coming to us live and direct from the Central Coast in Eastern Australia. He's the author and co-author of half a dozen books. He's written articles for New Dawn magazine. He recently discovered the, the location of stone block structures in the Australian outback that resemble the stonework at Machu Picchu in Peru. Mr. Strong, great to have your company today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Tell us, sir, first of all, uh, how long have you been interested in, in the field of archaeology? Uh, well, it started um, through education because to begin with I was a teacher. I got involved part of being part of the group that wrote the uh, curriculum for the high school certificate for New South Wales and sort of over the years became more involved in the culture. It's sort of like the end of a 25-year process. It started quite back in school then continued past when we started to go through and look at the archaeology and talk to the elders. So, so what initially led you to the, the Gosford Glyphs? Well, initially I wasn't interested. It's really important. People think, oh, you've been on some sort of crusade. To begin with, what happened is a lady by the name of Nina Angelo was head of a group that were actually fighting for the glyphs, contacted us and said, when we come down and speak, on behalf of the fact that we detected an Egyptian presence everywhere by the glyphs that had been to them. So we came in from that process. The first two times in the public meetings we spoke on all the other Egyptian iconography we'd found in the region. We never spoke on behalf of the glyphs until the elders gave us direction and gave us the full story. Until then we kept away from it. So you found quite a, uh, a treasure trove of uh, Egyptian influence in uh, Central Coast Australia? Look, it was in some of the oldest rock art in the region. I was with people who had degrees in um, geology who were telling me the uncle we looked at, which took, we took 22, 23 photos to get one that worked and we had to wait for the sun to come out. It's an unk, an Egyptian unk, and inside on one side is an ibis footprint. Now, if people know a bit about Egypt, Egyptian mythology, Thoth, the bringer of wisdom and knowledge, always carried an unk, and one of his two uh, animal forms was an ibis. And that's exactly what it was. Wow. It's like over 10,000 years old. And there it is amongst all these other original carvings of original content, which I'm quite familiar with. And then further on, we found other depictions of Thoth again with an Egyptian headdress in monkey form, in profile, which original people don't do. And the story around there sort of paralleled the Isis and Osiris story. And then further on, the Egyptian god of inheritance, and so it continued. So by the time we once got down to that region, we were very open to the idea that uh, Egyptians had been there, but quite ambivalent about the Egyptian glyphs at that time. Were you ever sceptical about the evidence you were uncovering about Egyptians in Australia? Were you ever sceptical about that? I was to an extent, but there's a, there's a point in our research that we remain very faithful to. I won't go forward and make any public statement until the elders give us guidance first. Now, the elders I work with there is only Bev Spears, she's a darking young elder, and a, a last full descendant, fully initiated. She's a keeper of country and law there, and she's the one we go through. Now, there's a day when we did um, an interview with both her and the original National Parks and Wildlife Sites Officer at that time, an original man who was paid by National Parks and Wildlife to work for them, arranging original sites and also doing maintenance. They sat down together one day and we recorded that interview. Well, once I heard that interview, everything changed. You see, the first person, being David Fitzgerald, and I can give their names because they both put it up, he's an original man, a blood descendant of Pemily, and also paid by National Parks and Wildlife to actually 
look at these sites. Now what happened was he had to bark and in fact bribe his way in to even look at it. Now the trick in this story is it took place in 1978. If you look at every official record for National Parks and Wildlife, they deny they saw it before 1983. And this is where the plot starts to thicken. Now here's adamant. When he found another original site that they didn't know about, he brought it in and said, look at this site here. Do you want it? Would you like to be part of it? And I said, oh yes, definitely. Where is it from? I'm going to show you. If you show me where these so-called Egyptian glyphs are, somewhere near Bambara, and I'll give you the site. Now what happened was, and these are his words, not mine. And he was a person paid on, he was an original person of high re respect. He said he was taken there late in the evening, just on dusk, sworn to secrecy, and there in front of him were the, the three cave walls, full to the brim, with rocks, debris, trees, decades of litter. But there along the top line you could see the beginning of the glyphs. Now he then spent two days with a full gang cleaning it out in 1978, not 1983. And that litter had been there for decades. Now he told us also that above the top, because there's a real problem with the glyphs insofar as they look quite recent. And we now know, and we know that the, that the roof is actually there, the roof ceiling. It collapsed in 1960. Until then the whole gallery was sealed off. So that gave us a setting. But the important part was what Arnie Beth Spears said, and she gave us more of an understanding about what is there and how it stayed that way and what it actually means. What she told us was this, that the original women from way back, from millennia, had come back to this place and coat the glyphs with women's urine to keep it fresh. Now remember, it's sealed off on the top with a rock wall that's all above the bottom there when it collapsed in 1960 and now they're keeping it fresh. And then she gave us the real clue in the story. And then she said, you do realize the Egyptian glyphs that are there are younger, and they're a copy of an older writing and hieroglyphs that belongs to the original people of this country. Now, we're inside there, and then I had a third elder later on, Aunty Minnie Mace, who gave us two artifacts that were found between the walls. Now, after that, I now say they're Egyptian because my elders have given me direction. So that's how we work. Your interview with uh, Mr. David Fitzgerald, the former uh, wildlife contractor, was, was very, very interesting. Uh, do, do you consider that that is solid evidence of an official cover-up that was taking place at his time? Oh, he's quite insistent, because as you probably know in the interview, I did bring it up once, and he said, it's very simple, I've lost my job for anything. Oh, definitely. I mean, it doesn't matter. They, they won't deal with me. They can't stand me anyway. So saying the truth isn't going to hurt. Without a doubt, David's of the same opinion. And I've, I've been subject to it. Our whole team has been subject to them actually covering up parts of this, deliberately ignoring evidence, which is quite obvious. So yeah, it's been an ongoing thing. We have elders who just pulled away because they were just so appalled by what took place and they're now just giving up the evidence. Wow. That's been going, ongoing ever since. We know for an absolute fact the record of 1973 uh, is wrong. We also know that the supposed perpetrators are always anonymous. It can be a deranged Yugoslav, or paid maybe some mysterious Sydney Uni students, but I'm not even sure which date, because some say 64, some say 84, and others claim it's a hippie that have done it. And so it goes, but you know, the funny part with all these different stories, some people say it was a grieving veteran from the First World War, dedicating this to his mates who died. All of them have anonymous names, and there's not one of these excuses that has a signed stat deck by the person they claim to be there. What I've got is elders all over this place telling me this Egyptians have been here, and there's an even ancient story that's also been there. So it's pretty easy. I know who to pick. I've got the anonymous group of people who did it at all different times, or the people who are here telling me what took place. And no brainer. Now, on your own personal website, ForgottenOrigin.com, you have on there your updates of your latest findings of, of what you found most recently. Can you divulge your assessments of what these areas were once used for or who made them? Yeah, look, they're working extensively, as you probably know, with Klaus Dea, who's supplying us access to technology and pictures that are quite revealing. What we're finding, is with the different sites, is there's a commonality. We believe there was an ancient ancient civilization. Look, I'm not going to put names on it because then people start to stereotype and say, oh, you're saying it's Lemuria, you're saying it's me, you're saying it's something else. I'm not. What I'm saying is we're seeing the archaeology that tells us there's a technology which is not rock on rock. You see, all we have to prove and whatever we find is if it's older than 200 years and it can't be done by rock on rock, we have an ancient technology. 
The Egyptians, I think, were here, the Phoenicians were here, but I think it goes way further back. So what we're finding throughout the whole of this region is evidence like that. Now what we then have to do is try and make sense of it. And the most obvious part of this story is, I've ever seen people using, uh, displaying some of the most amazingly masonry skills that really defies anything but the finest blade imaginable. There's one site that comes to mind immediately. Now this particular site is a compass and it was eight-sided, a bulldozer's driven over part of it, it's been inscribed in the hardest, hardest rock you'll ever find. I think it's the third one of our videos. Yes, that's right, part three. Yeah, that's it. Now that particular site has a compass and we're working on it at the moment, I mentioned this to you before, and you've got the eight angles, all at 45 degrees, perfectly straight. Original people don't do perfectly straight lines and got this perfectly fine circle with not even a hint of a little bit of a jagged edge with the straight blade hit on the side there. It's a perfect cut that goes all the way around. It's about a mirror cross that goes down at 90 degrees, the base is 180 and comes up, all eight lines start like that. Mm. What sort of blade does that? Now, actually the gentleman found that, Mark Bates, got a professor from Sydney Uni to come on site and look at it and he said, yes, we can do it in the laboratory, not in the field yet. And here it is in the middle of the bush, it's been there for a long time, but the most important part of this story was it took the most sophisticated technology known on this planet to do, and some, but it's 15 degrees off north. So, so Copy my mob day, well, right? They so, managed to get the finest piece of work you'll ever see when it comes to masonry and cutting angles and circles. We're off it by 15 degrees. That goes back more than 200 years when this earth was spun around by 15 degrees east of north. So it's quite possible that this uh, thing uh, was actually designed in the rock at a time when we had a different north pole. That is exactly what this shows us straight away. Now we've got people working on it at the moment. But it shows us two things. That's a signpost of the technology here. Now remember the original people before Cook are supposed to be naked hunter-gatherers with a rock stick technology. That's it. So I'm seeing a cut there that's way beyond them, but I'm claiming to you it's a cut beyond the province of copper and brass, and I even think it's a cut beyond the province of metal, but I'll stick with that for now. I suspect we're looking at a very sophisticated technology of Mark this in. Wow. Way more sophisticated than our university part professor tells us from New, New, uh, Newcastle Uni than we've got today. So that's what we find in the ground and uh, marked here in one spot. Now we see these cuts all over the Bambara Canada region. We see a lot of indicators of a technology like the tunnel system we found with Klaus. It's all over the place. Is it not true that uh, most of these markings and monuments and, and glyphs that you're finding, they're actually uh, placed upon very specific and deliberately designed longitude lines? <laughs> um, well, where can I start? Uh, did you know that uh, Bambara is 33 degrees south, the pyramid is 33 degrees north? Oh, there's, so many, there's so many different things there. We we'll also know for a fact, uh, can I add to that a bit if you don't mind? Of course, it, yeah. But, some of these places, that particularly the uh, map readings that Klaus has given us of this ancient civilization, will go there. Often we can't get inside, which is what we're trying to do, but we find markers, and when we get there more than once now, we've had amazing, amazing reactions. I mean, the, the, the cave that got uh, Iolan orbs is one, and we've got another one we're still working on how to put up, which is just as phenomenally supernatural. So what we're tend tending to find is these particular really important sites, uh, ancient sites were placed on places of high spiritual power and significance. Now one place we went to, one indistinct rock had five different dialanthons. For those people who don't know, most probably won't. The original people put in dialanthons, which were dreaming markers, on power lines. Now this particular rock has five on one, which means it's got five different areas that come into that rock. Wow. It got there because it was an ancient civilization marker, and there's relics there, which I don't want to talk about now because only halfway through them. But here we are with um, these dowsing rods none of us have ever held before, standing near one marker over 10 feet away, and it's spinning 360 degrees in our hands. We've never done this stuff before. Damn. And we just walked on this place because of the stuff that was found elsewhere, and then we find this happening time after time. Culture, different yeah. civilization, far more advanced, but probably, in fact, definitely far more spiritually aware. Now, I'm just taking a guess here. That, that what you're talking about uh, seems to suggest that there was more than just a settlement here. There was, in fact, a city or a civilization living in Australia from, from the ancient uh, Australians. Is that correct? 
utterly, without a doubt. I mean, I can't fight with the evidence I'm seeing. Um, look, if I can, if we can, I'd like to raise the issue of what we call Klaus's walls, because the ones that actually were... It's in, look, a lot of these sites that Klaus gives us to are the most appallingly difficult, sometimes incredibly dangerous sites to get to, and it's not a place that people are going to come on to. Uh -huh. And often we're very obtuse with the, the, the actual location, and I'm going to be in this case too. I'm sorry, but it's too precious to have fools and idiots wandering upon it, and also those without original sensibilities and understandings, because the first people own these sites. Now, this particular site is... I rated in the top three most dangerous sites I've been to, and every time I go there, I dread dropping, jumping across one bit because if it's so steep, if you miss your foot as you jump across about a two-metre spread, you've got to jump onto another foot and then spring up the hill. And if you don't, you go back down, you're going to roll 100 metres, and it's going to hurt. Wow. But when you get there, you get inside something that's dangerous to even stand on, and when you get inside, it's perfectly flat. That's the first thing they notice we got inside this thing, and it made it made of three walls. Now, we put pictures up on a, an article, which I think you guys actually noticed, didn't you? And that's yes, how sir. You got to yep. us. Um, and that particular article was about, I think it was called something like, it's a bit banal and trite, but that's what I do with the headings, um, another block in the wall. Now, you write about the, the cut and the join being like the ones in South America. So much so that I was taking the leaflets of paper and I could slide them just in maybe 15 centimetres and it was a perfect join all the way along. Wow. What really sort of surprised us was the synchronicity of the walls. And if I can give some examples, there are four set, three sets of walls that have all got four layers. Now the base wall in each one is either 190, 190 or 189 centimetres tall. Now that seems an amazing coincidence if it's just by pure chance. That's pretty precise work. Well, it gets worse. The front two walls, the upper two walls, their height is 293 or 292 centimetres. And both have four, four, one has four layers and one has three layers. And most of those rocks are rectangular, time after time. Now the cut on the second wall, which is the middle wall, if it's 190 on one side, I can go around the other side and it'll be exactly the same measurements on both sides. Uh -huh. That is an amazingly straight cut on a slope that is running at 45, 50 degrees. So you would see that the actual way the pressure is not pushing vertically out at 180, it's pressure pushing in a different way. And all fractures should not be going straight. They should be running the same way the pressure is. Mm. So we're finding all these straight rocks. But what we also find amazing is those three walls together. If you look above, the shelf above is 180 degrees. It's sitting on top of those three walls. And they are separate from the shelf above. So which means to us they've either built those walls into that shelf or perished the thought. And I don't, can't even think about this one, but the walls were put there first and then the thing was put on top because the shelf on top weighs 150 tonne. Jeez. So that's the beginning of a structure and look, the whole thing weighs hundreds of tons anyway that we were taken to solely by the markers that Klaus gave us and no one's going to find it. You could walk within two metres of this and all you'd be worried about is whether you're going to die. You're not going to be looking at it. If you look down, you can't see the entrance. It is so difficult to find. Doesn't that sound like what they used to do with the Valley of the Kings? This sounds very re reminiscent to me of the stones at Baalbek in Lebanon. Well, you know, it, it, the problem is that we know it leads somewhere, and I got about 15 metres down one tunnel, but because of the fact there's been earthquakes there and sandstone doesn't go well with earthquakes in Newcastle, the whole shelf is falling down. And I could manage to go about over 10 to 15, but I was just, I'm scrawny, but I couldn't go any further. And we know that there's more and it runs further, so what we have there, and we have it elsewhere. We've found, we've found the same walls that you see at Klaus's walls, we've found them in so far four other places. We've got another one we're putting, putting, uh, putting up, pardon me, mm -hmm. at the moment that goes to the Cave of the Owls in the Orch, um, which is just as artificial as the one we're talking about now, and another site again. But yeah, it's ancient, it's very ancient. Klaus, ourselves, and the other people we're working with are all agree agrees with that. But th there's no assessment on who made them? I mean, at this stage, you, you've got no idea? Well, yeah, well, well, I have, because you know what I do when I'm never sure about something? I know it's going to sound like, oh, my God, he's harping the same point. <laughs> well, whenever I'm not sure, I go and ask the original people. Uh-huh. It's really simple, because these people are living here when it happened. If you're going to ask anyone, 
Go and ask the residents. Go and ask, don't ask the people of any until it is. I don't know. They're still guessing. So we ask them, and they're very insistent about the sequence here. Now, whether it be Jerry Bosco, who told me that the, um, the structures around this region that are made by the Pleiades, the people that they're their ancestors, Aini Bev calls them the carriers from up there. We see them all over carry-on. We see these helmeted people. In fact, I haven't seen them yet in any of the figures around there. There's a dreary story that runs across the whole of this country, and it's called the Seven Sisters. And it's about Pleiades being chased by Orion, being the male. And as you guys probably know, Orion points up to Pleiades, they go together. And that is where, that's the one dreaming story that transcends boundaries and tribal estates. You hear it everywhere. Well, most other dreaming stories relate to a particular place and what took place at their event. They don't care about other people with other languages and other places in Australia. It's a bit like people in Italy keeping myths of the Germans as part of their culture. They don't. They know of it, but they don't keep it and they don't own it. So that's very important. But that story goes everywhere. And what I've found is elder after elder is insistent that there is an Pleiadian involvement here. So whether the uh, civilization we're looking at is Pleiadian or whether it's the legacy of the Pleiadians coming to Australia, it's one or the other. And maybe from that point we get Lemuria, we get all these other things that take place. I'm not so sure because I, I try to stay with what the evidence is. And the archaeology of an incredibly ancient evidence, we're finding not just in Bamboa, we're finding it up where we are at the moment, up near Byron Bay, Molumbindi. We're finding it in other places in the Blue Mountains. It's all over the coast. There is an ancient story here, and it goes way back. I do recall a uh, metallurgy site that was found up near the Gimpy Pyramids, and uh, this this also yeah. related to the yeah, story. I remember the slag that was there. Yeah. Let, this... let me tell you, share with you, I'm Arnie sure. Winnie Mace who's very insistent about, A, the Pleiadian link, and of course the Egyptian link. She's, I reckon she's the expert in Australia on Egyptian knowledge and mythology, and it's links to Australia. She knows so much. She gave us two pieces of evidence at the very start, and I didn't want to take them, but she insisted. One was a piece of metal that had a perfectly circular metal clasp, and it looks to me like it's someone kneeling with their hands sort of raised as they're praying, and it's made of a metal that I've shown metal urges around the country, actually, and no one can identify it properly because it's not made of iron ore. It doesn't have copper, it doesn't have lead, it doesn't have zinc, it doesn't have all the traditional things that it should have, but it's incredibly light, and everyone I give it to says, oh my God, it feels like aluminium. Wow. The problem is where it was found at Bambara is about 900 k's, 1,000 k's and more from the closest aluminum site, and you need 700 degrees to melt bauxite and turn into aluminium. But everyone says the same thing. What's it doing between two walls where there's all these ancient glyphs that have been engraved there? So there's metal all over the place, and as you know, there are amulets that are 5,000 years, and there's some stuff that Rex Gilroy's got, ancient remains too, of those dates. It's all over the place. The problem is, is I think there's a tipping point where you say there's so much evidence about Egyptians, I actually find it. Look, we, I think I've counted about 60 pieces of hard evidence in archaeology and original mythology at the moment, and we sort of lost interest in it to an extent. Because it's overwhelming. I'm fascinated by going back further. And really struggling with the big question, why did the Egyptians come here for over 4,300 years continually, risking their lives every time, to a country you can't get slaves from, they didn't get any, that um, there's no massive buildings and there's no monuments that have been made, what were they coming from? And we believe it was spiritual wisdom, the esoteric insights that came from way back, maybe even way back to Pleiades. Wow, that's that's what interested in. That's a fascinating statement. Well, it's where we're going because that's what the original pe people actually tell us to do. Our custodian, Nani Bevnell, is of the intro our stage now where she's asking us now the people we take on site, do they believe in the carriers from up there? Okay. I mean, one of them, if I read, one of her dreaming stories is about the mothership crashing just in front of the waters, only three k's away from where the glyphs are. That's part, of it, that's part of her story. She remembers the old people telling her that story. So, it's, you see, we don't have a choice in this. I didn't even, to begin with, when we came into this, I didn't even want to touch the Egyptian part of the glyphs. And from that, I got dragged way past that, and now I'm talking about Pleiades. And honestly, a year ago, our first three books were published by University Press of America, vetted by professors. 
We would never mention this sort of stuff there. <laughs> they, would have, they wouldn't have looked at it. They would have thrown it out and burned it. Now, now the actual hieroglyphs themselves do tell a story oh, yeah. about uh, Nefer Dijab and Nefer Tururu. That's a small part of the story on the first wall. They certainly do tell that Egyptian story, yes. Yes, I, I have heard that uh, mentioned before, that story about the Egyptian bitten by a snake uh, written in the hieroglyphs. So do hmm. these these hieroglyphs have been uh, confirmed as as, the, as to what that story is? Um, the real issue with the, the hieroglyphs there is the, the first wall, the first section of the first wall, has over an 80% match to a manual we used from Ray Johnson. Now, Ray Johnson worked with uh, Dr. Abu Ghazi in putting together what they sort of call proto-Egyptian or pre-Egyptian hieroglyphs. And they worked for some time. We've got handwritten notes from her signing back and talking about their correspondence that they put it together. Now, she's from the Egyptian Museum and she was the director of general at the time. Now, we looked at his work because he discovered them first and he worked on them for years and years, an incredibly intelligent man. And he should put together a manual of 3,010 glyphs. Now, only Minnie gave me one of his manuals. We've got one of the very few that actually are outside his or only Minnie's. And we've used that. But the trick is this. After you go past what we think is the Egyptian story about Nefertiti, I definitely see that reading there from the Proto-Egyptian that Ray Johnson's done. Once you go to the next two walls, your match to Proto-Egyptian drops from over 80 to below 45%. Now, a lot of critics have said, oh, well, that's an example of why it's fake, because it should be much more faithful to Egyptian. But no, we think that is the original part of the story, the original language, and that the Egyptian part that was added later is a derivative. And if you've got the first language, you can't use a derivative manual and then read it. You can't. You'll get ideas. That's right. But you'll lose it because 55% of the myths that have passed that wall do not match in any Egyptian reading. Now, people fudge a bit and slide them in, but I can see them a lot of times and no, you just can't do it. There's nothing that's close. Now, we think that's the first language, the oldest way of writing, and therefore it's difficult to read the two, but we think by now, and we've done a lot of work with Led Scranton, who's a, a, a real expert on Dogon and Egyptian hieroglyphs, and is working on what he calls the first language, which is the Na Ki. Now we believe, and he's leaning that way, it's not there all the way at the moment, but he's certainly working with us a lot, and he's liaising quite constantly. There's one group there, which is just a stick man standing. Now, Led became very involved because that one's not Egyptian, but according to him, it is the symbol for the Nike language, the very first language, and it's placed above everything else. And it has two other meanings, black man and serpent. Well, the original people worship the serpent. They are black, and they made the first language. So it sort of makes sense that stick figure would lead off the whole of that passage. And we believe that second wall and third wall, which make about 260 glyphs, are the original first story of the first language. And in that, we believe that particular place and one we're working up, which we call the Standing Stones, form a sort of tabernacle wow. and a testimony about our heritage, our gods, and our purpose. Th there is a, there other is areas to that story we're still working on. There, there's a very, very interesting glyph amongst that that you're talking about that uh, caught my eye that looks uh, very much like um, some kind of laboratory. Oh, yes, that one. Watch well, you now. I don't know what else it can be, and I know the one you're talking about, and I'm sure it's in that people want to look, they'll see it in the article. That's exactly what we called it. You see, what's interesting with that one is that particular laboratory is surrounded by one figure that appears five times all around there. Now, at the very first time it appears right up near the stick man, there's a figure there which has got three circles and a leg. Now, according to Laird's book, Sacred Symbols of the Dogon, if you go to page 220, you will see exactly the same symbol, exactly the same. And according to him, it means double helix DNA. Oh. There it is standing on its legs, but there's a progression in the stories, ladies and gentlemen. What then happens is a bit further down, we see the three circles, we see the legs, but it's got arms standing out, or pushing out, extended. And further down, as you get closer to the laboratory you so correctly identified, the glyph gets bigger. Three bigger circles, the hands are standing out, and inside the hands are two pyramids. And then just above the laboratory, we see the three circles running on the horizontal, and dissecting it in the middle is a staff that bisects like splices a gene right in the middle. And those three circles together look exactly like a gene. And below that is what you identify as the laboratory. Wow. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to put that together and come up with 
is somebody creating us because that's what that passage says and that's why the so-called experts can't read it when they say oh we see Sumeria in there we see a bit of this and we see some ancient Egyptian but it doesn't make sense because it's all over the place and that's fine because all the other languages come from there so their signs will be sourced there and of course they'll change in as they go and these symbols that we're seeing are the originators we are we are we are looking at that approximately how many identifiable and non-identifiable hieroglyphs have you found to date in your research on that wall um i would say we were sitting at around about of the 300 until Laird's involvement who gave me up some very plain glyphs that i actually gave not much account to we were sitting on about probably about 180 that we were confident with because you've got to be so careful if it is what we all say the most ancient language you know we're not going to get it right no matter how often we do it because there's no base there's no manual we have to look at other people and we've got a lot of people from all over the place very versed in this stuff that are helping us too and we put it all together but after Laird's input where he gave us some of the plain ones that we thought oh mm, god that's just a pot or that's just a square we'll ignore that that pushes us towards about well over 200 and gets us a bit closer to the story we thought we'd find there. And, and what really debunks the myth that these were created by some sort of uh, crazy Czech or uni students is the fact that these hieroglyphs are not just found in one area. They're all over the place. Is that not true? Yes. There's two things that debunk it. We've actually found a second set of glyphs that no debunking theory, no national parks or government even know about. It is separate, a long way away. <laughs> the important part of the story is, ladies and gentlemen, look at that third English term, we can read it, we know what it says, most of it, not all of it, because it's sitting around that 44% again. Um, but, a long way away, one third the size, one third the incision, completely different tools were used, but exactly the same glyphs. Are you telling me now that this so-called Havand or hoax has gone off and done another set of that's never just been found until about a year ago along on the way separately is also this is becoming too duplicitous for just a random act of vandalism or stupidity absolutely and it's so different so this person is really clever whether it's uni students or no one else but here's the point all the people who claimed or said they did it said they did it between the walls well we've got other glyphs we put pictures up they're there. And so far, I guess what official response we've had from the fact we've posted it all over the place? Nothing. So it sounds sounds like just yet another uh, government complicity to, or government uh, conspiracy to cover this stuff up. Well, let's call it endemic government apathy towards anything that doesn't fit into convenient truths. And Do let's try and be look on the bright side without quoting from the life of Brian. I'm inclined to think in some cases I've even used those terms in one or two instances of things that have happened to us. And for now, I'll try and give them the benefit of the doubt when bugger all exists and say, well, maybe it's just utter apathy, but the science we have brought into this, and people can check our website, Forgotten Origins, and we've got a lot of science in here. It's been very well researched, and that's why we have some very powerful backers, because Evan and I don't work on our own. We work in a collective, and when we, we, when we write a new article, we send it off to about 15 other people with degrees all over the place, and they all come back and they refine, and people on site that work with us have got a lot of knowledge too. So we come up with a collective statement, our main name might be on it, and we write most of it, but it's always under guidance. Just about the send one off to an elder because I've mentioned his name and I might have made a mistake it's got to be checked because we're trying to make sure when we get this story out we don't make any mistakes where you suggest it's government apathy I kind of feel that uh, this uh, Australian government is trying to conceal this stuff to make out Captain Cook as some kind of discoverer or hero uh, he was nothing more than an imperialist colonizer as far as I can see he was just an invader all right then, well look, what I'm going to say now will probably stock up your belief in a conspiracy and destroy mine that it's just ignorance, but I'll <laughs> share the truth with you, okay? Okay. This is an absolute fact, and if anyone's to check, they can because it's true, because everyone knew what happened at the time. December the 10th, 2012, one of my friends who rarely raises before nine rang us at seven o'clock and said, you're not going to believe this. The article that we shared with an ABC report, and I'm going to use her name, and bless her for doing this before she got smashed by a boss. It's Mary Louise Vince, I think her name is Vince. She, we've taken her out to some sites. We didn't take her out to the Gosford this. We shared with her half a dozen sites around the region to show her how strong our case was. 
Well, what happened was she did an article up one minute 40 seconds, and there it was, the second item on the ABC National News, on Triple J, and all the ABC things was in Perth, it was all over the country. And it was the second item, and I've got to tell you, if I'd done the item myself, I would have been slightly more negative than that item was. Then it gets better. My son goes to the website, because I don't know anything about this sort of crap, and tells me that there's going to be an article up. Well, I read it, and it was embarrassing. It was even more pro us than the other one, because we took this woman out and showed her things. Uh -huh. Proper archaeology. And she came away utterly stunned, and she knew there were Egyptians there. She knew something ancient was there. I could see it, because we showed them. Within an hour and a half, that item had been taken off every ABC outlet in this country. Within half an hour later, that website had been taken down, and two days later they put up a standard item that had written ten years before by two archaeologists who said the glyphs are fake and they're all rubbish and they were done by deranged Yugoslav. The news item never mentioned the Gosford glyphs, the Bambara glyphs. We went away from it. We tried to show people there's so much supporting evidence around that place, we don't need them. We've got enough without them. But what then happened was, it was taken off completely. Now, one of our backers is a professor from a university. We've got a few like that, and he is known. And he kept harassing them for an explanation from the ABC, our government broadcasters, fair and impartial and always, as we know. And the final answer was, we took it off because we don't have to explain why. What we do know is, that's never happened before. They only take items off when there's a public complaint, and then they put together a panel. It's not done that quickly. Then they make an apology three days later, way down the back of the article, or Daily Telegraph's face, page 39 in a small corner. They don't do this, and everyone agreed that didn't make sense, and it wasn't right. That one, I'm afraid, is not ignorant. Somebody from above the ABC would manage to get that off within an hour and a half of being put there and completely destroyed the whole thing. A couple of, couple of people in our group managed to capture the first website article before they destroyed that again, and you can't even find it now. Wow. Now, if that isn't a conspiracy, my friend, I don't know what it is, but I'm still again trying to find a way around that maybe it was just utter ignorance, but for that one, no. Yeah, Somebody that... was involved to make sure that evidence didn't get out. Because you're right, it does change a perspective, a really important perspective on the history, not only of this country, but other countries, because it does start to open up. Do we have laser cutting up and carry on? Do we have technology that should never be? The answer is, of course we do. Are we ready to talk about that and acknowledge that there may be a complete different history to humanity mm. and maybe as we've said many times that we knew the original people their genes and their culture was exported all over the world and we believe until about five or six thousand years ago the whole of the planet was living under the precepts of the dream where you can't invade another country you can't walk on there without permission if you do fight you find a degree place then it's called up when it's finished no one steals anything your history stays intact all those things take place and yes they still fought anyway but there was honor now that was the way we all lived where everybody owned their own tribal estate and was in contact with the gods and that's the way we lived all the way that's the way humanity was and maybe we saw peaks in technology where sometimes we fell away and maybe that land has got too messy and the whole thing was destroyed and we went back to the same way of living. But it could be that when Akhenaten took the Egyptians back out and said, take your clothes off and we're going to worship one god, he was reinstating the precepts of the dream dreaming again in a sedentary society. Maybe it didn't work. Maybe that was the only attempt. But before the sedentary plough, money, division of ownership, before that took place, maybe we are meant to be cooperative, spiritual human beings, not aggressive pieces of shit that spend half our money every day on finding ways to kill or protect ourselves from being killed. Maybe this is a nightmare. And I think that's one of the two reasons why the Australian government is not keen for this story to get into mainstream because it challenges some paradigms and assumptions of us as human beings. Instead of Darwinian survival of the fittest, maybe we should be looking at something where we're cooperative spiritual beings are the only way we did survive. And in the last 5,000 years they started making up stories and excuses for the mess they started creating. Wow. Well, maybe not. That's just an opinion. Got no archaeology on that one, but sometimes we think like that. Well, some very deep concepts there. Uh, one thing that I noticed in a lot of your videos is uh, a lot of evidence of liquefied stone at some of these uh, places. Is that not true? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Yes, so now I'm, I'm working with one of the top geologists in this country, and he says to me, ah, natural forces, natural forces. But I'm going to say this, and I know he won't mind me saying this. 
he quite recently wrote a letter to the mayor of Gosford saying that we had rocks, not a rock, like he tells us, but rocks that weren't natural. Now this guy actually has told me, he calls, says, call me Mr. Natural, and he said if I found the Sydney Opera House a thousand years from now, he would say it's natural. But we've shown him rocks. And he says, oh no. Well, he won't say he'd have it's been applied. But what he won't say is this, he says, I cannot think of any process that can explain how rocks got to this state. So yes, there are. We've been to quite a few places. There's one place where we actually believe there was some sort of explosion from above that melted everywhere. Incredible amounts of heat. Where you see every type of bizarre melted sandstone rock formation you could possibly get, and they're all in one area. It's a place where we found drains that go for 10 metres that are perfectly straight that Nina, Gavin's uh, close par partner and friend, could sit inside, and we've got pictures of her sitting inside this drain that is that straight, and on the outside, the lip is 68 centimetres on one side and 68 centimetres on the other, and it goes for 10 metres. Tell me, that's natural. Wow. Here's the trip. What was a sluice gate like that being used in a place that no white fellas got to until about 40 years ago? Yeah. We found, oh, sort of pottery shards. We found a column that's 30 foot high that's been broken in pieces. There's something, in, in these different civilizations, we have the indications of two different events. One is something from above in our original stories, stories all over the area. Of course, we go back there again of a huge explosion in the sky, and that's one of them. But we've also got the stories of a massive, massive water tsunami coming up over 100 metres. We actually have found small periodicals inside the wedges of one particular sandstone um, wedge there, a ledge rather, and that's 110 metres above sea level today. So we've got both things taking place there. I don't know which one destroyed that civilization. Was the explosion we found in a different place where that civilization, which we think is a mining community from way back? We're not sure. Or whether the tsunami took the first one out. It wouldn't have got the second one. The second one's way away. But it certainly probably hit the first one, but I don't know. Where. We're not sure. Well, Mr. Strong, this video is coming out on Australia Day in 2014. Uh, very, very interesting uh, synchronicity there. Uh, so what you're basically saying is Captain Cook was not so much of an explorer or discoverer or uh, adventurer. He was more of a war criminal who broke laws. Broke laws everywhere. He broke his own law because I've read exactly what he was told to do. Right? He had no right to raise the flag and claim, claim anything. He wasn't given that right. It was very specific. He broke the law of the Admiralty and the law of the, um, what we still use today, that's why it's called the dock. He broke that law too. International law, don't forget, Spanish and Portuguese were sailing boats hundreds of years before the British. What happened was the Vatican started to worry basically about those two countries fighting and they basically cut up the whole of the world. They gave the Spanish the east coast of Australia and they gave the Portuguese the west coast of Australia. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen, that's why we know they were there. They gave them that area before the British even had a boat. Now, that's not a, an opinion. We'll go back to fact there. That's an actual fact. And they knew about Australia. It, they all knew about what the place was and they were allowed to come. We know the Portuguese come up where we are now. We've heard, we know where they've been. The original people know all about this stuff. They know they were here. They were allowed to stay. And if they broke the law, they were told to leave. And everyone was told to leave and they left. Only one group, when they were told to leave, didn't go, and that was the British. Everyone else obeyed the law. You see what's happening here? The only criminals in all of this, and this is an outright theft of monumental proportions that broke international law. Everyone abided by that, otherwise it would have been absolute chaos. Everyone, the Portuguese and all the Europeans, they were just like, they're going to take the rest of the world. But we've got to have some rules of engagement or beat the crap out of each other. This is how it came about. It's not just a law for one place. The colonizers had to have some code of crappy ethics, and it wasn't much, but this was the law they broke, the only one. And don't forget, the French landed in La Perouse on the other side within two weeks and stayed for quite some time. And the only reason they left was because they had a war and lost with the original people on that side, and quite a few inch, and they left because they couldn't stay there much longer, they were going to kill them. If that hadn't happened, were well, the French going to leave? Did they accept the, the English way of taking this as being right? I don't think so. And the problem is, the Arpurus and all three of those boats died on the way back. We'll never know the full story. But I can tell you this, the British broke every possible law within their own rules and every original law within their rules. Do you find that we're reaching a pinnacle point, maybe a, an awakening of uh, monumental proportions where, where they can't keep denying the truth any anymore? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, look, 
The reason that we're giving all this information up, and we are, we've got so much of it, is simply because literally two weeks after I was given the ceremony by Kano Walker and, and the original Ramanjuri men in South Australia, from that point on we've been swamped nearly on a daily basis with information from all over the country. So much so sometimes we just look we can't fit in. So much so that right now we're putting together a foundation and trying to raise money and luckily people are putting money in so we can continue doing this because I'm not exaggerating, we will get four or five really strong offers of archaeology per day and we've offended some people because we just couldn't get there. We meet as often as we can and we go out into some of the most incredibly difficult bush that's full of every sharp piece of vegetation on the planet. We get ourselves cut to pieces because that's where the place is because no one goes there. That's why all the stuff is there. But we knock back so many because we just can't fit it in. Wow. But yes, what is interesting is it's come since that and it's come because the original people are telling me constantly. Would you say there's a lot of value in, um, uh, in white people learning about the Dreamtime legends? Every value and nothing to be lost and everything to be gained. Mm. These were the first people. This is where the first language begins. It's where the first religion begins. There's a place up there we're working on which is called the Standing Stones that the professor of Australian Archaeological Society in 1939 nine claimed was Australia's Stonehenge and was the oldest religious temple in the world. And there he claims, this, guess what, is the word again, this is not for me, it's from the guy who was the president of the Australian Archaeological Society. He claims that there he found the first language ever recorded. And it's exactly the same as what we found between the glyphs. And he was able to, in 1939, get in contact with elders and people of the first language, and he got a complete translation of that language. Wow. His site was only around for nine months. Because when it was found out, everyone got incredibly excited because it was what it was. There were thousands of cubic metres of stuff that had been moved there from at least 20, 30 kilometres away. Everyone couldn't work it out. But in nine months, the Australian government officials approached the farmer and threatened to take his farm away. So the next day, the farmer's son went out and destroyed the site. And that site did contain the very first map and stone arrangement and markings that tell us a story about our, our past. And according to him, not me, he said the stone arrangement contained all the information about our past, what is, and what, what, what will ever come to be. That's how deep what was written there was recorded. And Slater, the top person in this country, the expert on Egyptian stuff that was paid by the Australian government to work for them, actually had that translation. Will we ever find out what it said? Uh, do we ever find out what it says? The answer would be most definitely because I actually know what it says because I managed recently to get a hold to the, uh, the Brunswick River Historical Society. They managed, they contacted me about four months ago. Huh. And they made contact that they found Slater's papers that have been written, hidden in a back room. I know this is going to sound like, like, like X-Files, but these people from the Historical Society contacted me, and this is what they said. This gentleman joined them. He decided to go to the back room there and went into a filing cabinet that was locked, opened it up, and there in the bottom was a folder with no title, nothing. I'm not lying, but that's what happened. And inside it were his handwritten notes. I've got a copy of them, and the other one is kept. There's other two, and they're locked inside a safe because in it, not only the translation, but the pronunciation of the sacred language. Wow. That's something that shouldn't be wandering around in the mainstream press. But what we can share with you, and we have the right to do so, is interpretation. And yes, I do know what a lot of it says. And I'm going to tell you, people may not want to hear it because they're not going to like the truth of it all, because I've got to tell you, if this is what the first language is, and according to the experts, it should be grunting. It should be simple things. If the first language started today, it would be focused on sex, drugs, rock and roll, like reality shows. Now, if you go back then, it should have been spears, food, primal urges. No, no, it started at the very top. And what it's done since then, what they wrote, has been an appalling, pummeling fall down. 
into dark. So you're, you're quite convinced at this stage that uh, there is a conspiracy covering up uh, Australia's history, that there is uh, plenty of evidence to suggest that uh, we have had uh, an amazing advanced civilization here in Australia, uh, that this truly is going on and it is being uncovered right now? It's being uncovered right now by others. And look, don't forget, this goes back to Rex Gould. He was doing this. Jeez. He was doing this when I was still uh, learning to be a teacher. He was doing this way before we were, and he's been doing it for 40 years, saying the same thing. But they all vilify him and call him the Yowie Man, but there's a lot more to that guy than just that. I mean, we don't believe in all the stuff he's got. He's got evidence of ancient civilization by the bucket loads, more than what we've got. But yes, his timing is wrong. But people seem more predisposed to listen to that story now, and yes, it is everywhere there. The word conspiracy, I've got to be so careful about this rotten word because it's sort of... And then it throws you into a category of a little, little bit like little green men and stuff like that, but, oh, I don't know. I don't know what else to call it. I don't even know if an order that's beyond staggered belief is possible. That could be the best that could come out of it. They could just be utterly stupid and blind and just refusing to change anything. And I'm looking on the good side there. And the most logical thing is that, well, since the December the 10th, 2012, really hard not to think it is something like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, right. as much as I hate to say no, I mean, yeah, last time we were out on board, helicopters flew over eight times in a row, directly above us, and we're in the middle of nowhere. Do I think that there's a camera in the front of the helicopter? Yeah, we saw that too. Are they taking pictures of us because we've gone out in the bush again in the national park, sin of sins? Probably. Mm. I mean, is that part of it? Possibly. But did they actually take our stuff off there? Definitely. Yeah, yeah, the media is certainly compliant in that. Well, if it's not a conspiracy, I consider it as a planned agenda to keep people's uh, spiritual growth at an all-time low. Because the, the more we grow, the more we learn, and the more we find out, the more we become empowered by ourselves as human beings to realize that we are a part of this world, and when they damage the world, they're damaging us. Exactly, and that's exactly what this is about. Now, you've actually summed up perfectly what this is really about, and that's what underlying all this, as I said before, they don't want us to find our true heritage and where we came from because it would question where we are. You see, people always say we are a sum total of what we've done before. Now, I'm sure you and most of your viewers believe in the story of reincarnation. So what we are right now is a sum total of all the history of our past. Well, how can we make a judgment about ourselves if amongst all that, all that legacy that we should have inside our soul, our rational mind is saying, oh, don't that rubbish it's not right and it's arguing every time we have an insight like that getting in the way from where we should be and we keep, we keep being told that we're just a beast that came out of the jungle and we're, we're a nasty piece of work and you get in our way and we'll cut your head off and that's okay because we've always been that way yeah I look at the chimps 99.9% .9 of the time they work as a cooperative group can we claim that and some people use the chimps they all oh, look they go to war but sometimes they eat meat and it happens every now and then yeah Sometimes, occasionally, with us, we're all the bloody time. Look at our history, what is it? You go to school and what do you learn about if you learn about our ancient and modern history? Yeah. Well, schools today um, are, are teaching compliance. They're teaching... Yeah, with yeah lies yep. about our past and where we came from. That's right. I mean, I actually was working. At one stage, I was working for the Board of Studies writing, and I had an argument when I was asked to come back and write for the Board of Studies. I said, I can't do this anymore. There's a real history here. We should be putting that in. They wouldn't do it, so I just left them. They have nothing more to do with it. They just weren't going to listen. Even though I was in at that early stage, we had a lot of facts and a lot of elders on our side that were just not going to put that in under any conditions because it doesn't fit in to their with agenda. a compliant, unquestioning society. Yes, and yes. What would they like to? It empowers too many people to ask questions. Yes, yes, we don't want that doing. We don't want people learning the original alphabet. C means a light going out. Well, at the moment, they're trying to block that light. It's the letter E. It's our first, uh, it's a very simple sign of the 190. I'm just talking about one simple letter here. Mm. At the moment, they're trying to block that light. And we're not even talking about a combination of words. It's that simple. And that's actually what our kids should be learning about in the schools. They should be learning about, ah, oh, this is what we're like, eh? A bit different from... The story we've got about the last two or three or four or five or six thousand years, I actually prefer 
this story and more, it looks much more honorable, doesn't it? Absolutely. Much more. It's much more human. We don't want people to see them like that, do we? Uh, well, Mr. Strong, thank you very much for your time and your company. You've, be, you've been very, very insightful and, and uh, amazing. You've, you've got some incredible information there and so glad you're getting it out to the people uh, because this is the time where people need to start asking questions. How do they get authority? Who made that shiny badge and who gave you the authority to take mm -hmm. away my freedom? <laughs> Tell him, George, who made that shiny badge? Don't trust him, whoever it is. Very good call. <laughs> God bless you, sir. It's been fantastic talking to you. I hope to catch up again soon with an update. Pleasure. My pleasure. I hope we can again. Indeed. Bye for now. Bye.